It's a lovely day in August 2012. It's a great day to be here with my Hawaiian shirt and several friends. Okay, we've just come around the block. The black building with the city museum is over on my right here. And we are in the former armory of the city of Geneva. We're here with four cannons, five, that were actually captured by Napoleon. Geneva prides itself on never being occupied by a foreign power, but they conveniently forget Napoleon because he maybe technically did not station troops here, but he was definitely in charge of Geneva for those years. Geneva got the cannons back at the Treaty of Vienna, which put Europe back together after Napoleon had messed it up. I think the city leaves the cannons here to remind the French that they didn't win after all. Anyway, what's interesting for us is three mosaics that represent three key moments in the history of the city. The first one is Julius Caesar, who came through Geneva on his way to capture Gaul, present-day France. He had to cross the river here because it was the only place where Rome had a treaty with the Celtic tribe that was holding the river. It was the only place he could cross with his army without fighting major battle. So he came to Geneva, around the southern side of the lake, actually. And he went from there to conquer Gaul. And he wrote about it. And modernist historians said for years that he made it up. It's a political document because they, in their academic pride, had no respect for ancient documents, especially the Bible, but all, all the others as well. The archaeologists have followed the traces of Julius Caesar, and everywhere where he says they were a bat there was a battle, they have found the archaeological evidence. So it's, it's true what Caesar wrote. Behind me is a tableau representing the trade fairs of the High Middle Ages. Because Geneva was free and independent, even if your king was at war with the other guy's duke, you could still come to Geneva and trade your stuff. So Geneva prospered by organizing 10-day trade fairs four times a year in the major Christian holidays. And people came from all over to trade their stuff. They came from the trading cities of northern Germany, all over France, all over Italy, and even from North Africa. So the Genevans were very wealthy by selling uh, baseball caps and Swiss Army knives to all the people. But the King of France got jealous of this revenue that he wasn't getting, so he established his own trade fair in Lyon. Nobody came, even the French. So he declared the death penalty for any French merchant who went to Geneva for the trade fairs. This is what we call transactional leadership, but sometimes it's very effective. So none, none of the French came. When the Italians saw that the French weren't coming, they abandoned their houses here in the city of Geneva, left them empty, literally. <clears throat> and then they, they moved to Lyon and built houses there. And you can still see those beautiful Mediterranean uh, houses in the old city of Lyon. So Geneva fell into poverty. Um, the city emptied out. It lost most of its population. A huge percentage of those who stayed were criminals who were wanted in other kingdoms around, prostitutes, and of course the spies. Well, the latter categories are still very well represented here. But that's, that was the state of the city when Calvin came, when the Reformation happened, and that was the reason for the, the poverty of Geneva. It had been prosperous because of the trade fairs, but then fell into poverty. The other tableau over here is the arrival of the Protestants, the French Huguenots, in the first wave. As you can see, this is a French noble. Many of them were from the noble classes. Many of them were from the southern part of France. And they came and they brought their skills, or in the case of the nobility, they brought their capital. They brought their gold with them. So one of the reasons for the immediate prosperity of Geneva at the time was that they brought their capital with them. And it was the influence of a lot of educated, talented, wealthy people into the city that changed things. And that was part of the reason for the prosperity. 
Okay, we're not going to film it, but let me just mention that um, to my left is City Hall. And if you walk in there, there's a staircase built by a, a guy who was so visionary, he wanted to ride his horse all the way to the top of the building to get to the meetings. <laughs> so the staircase is built to, to accommodate a horse being ridden up it. It's a very cool visionary idea. Okay, we're sitting inside Calvin's auditorium, Auditoire. It's the small church located right next to the cathedral. Um, there's been a church on this spot since the 5th century. The original churches were built where the cathedral is. We don't know exactly when, but the ruins they have found of the original stone churches were from the 5th century. The first, we know that Christianity arrived in the 2nd century because the Roman prefect of Geneva converted to Christianity, and that's recorded in the, in the written history. The gospel probably arrived actually in the first generation brought by businessmen up the Rhone from Marseille. Um, if Paul went to Spain, the Apostle Paul, as many people think he did, then he would have stopped in Marseille and he would have preached the gospel there. So it's very possible that the gospel came to Geneva that way. And then there were many Christians in the Roman army who brought the gospel to Switzerland as well in different generations. Anyway, this, this was a church built next to the main churches. Um, and at the time of the Reformation, it had been the prayer chapel of the bishop because the bishop has to have his own chapel to pray in. It's, you can't just pray with everybody else. It's kind of like the provost. <laughs> anyway, they closed down the church at the time of the Reformation, <clears throat> but very quickly they realized they needed a, a smaller place where Calvin could teach. And so this was the place that he taught several times a week. The Reformation in Geneva had several factors contributing to it. One was this vacuum, this huge hunger for change that is an absolute prerequisite. People ask me, can Geneva have another reformation? And I, I say, not this year, because things are going too well. Why should you want to change your whole life when you live in Geneva? And you get a Genevan level salary. There's no hunger for change in the culture. But it can happen in other places where is, there is that kind of vacuum and that kind of hunger. And of course, there are many of those nations in the world. The second was an incredibly gifted apostolic team. Most of the leaders from a huge nation were exiled and they came to Geneva. They came to join Calvin in his, his noble experiment to rebuild a church and a nation on the principles of the Word of God. So you had a huge talent pool that was concentrated here. Um, for example, Calvin recruited his favorite teacher from school, Mathieu Cordier, to run the school system here. And it was a, it's an incredible work that he did in education. Pierre Vigé was an educator also, and ran the schools in Lausanne, especially the University of Lausanne. We'll talk more about that later. <clears throat> but it was this, this apostolic team that came together, which is what's needed for a city with the influence of Geneva. By the way, let me mention here another very recent reason for the influence of Geneva, and that is that this Geneva and the, this whole lake area has become a center for commodities trading. Eighty percent of the world's commodities, the minerals, the oil, the grain, they're traded right here. Switzerland has no commodities except for granite and snow. But all the world's commodities are traded in this place. This is the marketplace of the world as well as the diplomatic capital of the world. Which shows that there's something going on in the spirit. And that's what we should be attentive to. Anyway, the other pillar of the Reformation, there was the, the need, the team, and then there was the daily preaching of the gospel. In the French Reformation, they believed that adult conversion was necessary. They were not like the Lutherans who believed that if you are a citizen, you are a Christian. So they preached the gospel daily in this city for generations because they knew not everyone had made that decision. And the whole thing was based, first of all, on a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. 
They knew that no change was possible in the nation unless there was this personal change that happened first. So there was the daily preaching of the gospel. Then there was the teaching. Calvin believed, as we've already said, that the Bible contained everything necessary to have solid families, solid spheres, in every area like education, the economy, um, the state as well as the church. It was all there in the Bible, so you needed to teach. And he taught here in this place. And we know he taught in that alcove actually, because we have a student notebook from the 16th century where the students draw a, a cartoon of Calvin teaching when he should have been taking notes. And some things never change. But he would teach here how to live. He would preach in the cathedral on Sunday, and then John Knox would preach here on Sunday because Knox, when he was persecuted by Mary, Queen of Scots, he came to Geneva, and he was pastor of the English-speaking refugees. And Calvin was very close to that congregation, and he was um, a friend of John Knox's. John Knox was the one who called Geneva the most heavenly place on earth. A lot of people were critical of what was going on here, but some of the ones who actually lived here at the time of Calvin were very positive about it. So Knox watched and listened the same way Calvin had in Strasbourg with Busa. Knox did that here and picked up on what was Calvin was doing, applied it back home in the Puritan Reformation, which had such an influence not only in Scotland and England, but then went to America when the Puritan movement went there, <clears throat> and also South Africa. So that was another way that the teaching of Calvin went around the world. It was through John Knox, actually. Um, what else to say about this chapel? There are exhibits here. You can, there's a cardboard cutout of Calvin so you can get your picture taken next to him. Hey. Dear Pastor, here I am with John Calvin in Geneva. The other cool thing is that for his uh, 500th birthday in 2009, they made these um, audiovisual presentations where they took engravings of what he, was, what he looked like and animated them and put them with texts of things he wrote, prayers that he prayed, sermons he preached, conversations he had that were written down. <clears throat> and so you can see Calvin praying, you can see him writing his books, and he's quoting the text out loud. You can hear him preaching the words that he actually preached. Because of the, the radical nature of his experiment and the interest around Europe, um, and because these guys really understood communication te technology and wanted to get their message out to the entire population, in contrast to the Catholic Church who didn't care about the entire population, they were very committed to getting Calvin's stuff printed. So every time he spoke in the cathedral or he taught here in the, in the auditorium, there was someone taking notes, and that person would write everything down and go straight to Calvin's printer. There were several printers in town, but one of them did only Calvin's stuff. And they would typeset it in the old printing presses, lead uh, letters for, for each character, and, but it would be printed and on its way around Europe within a week. Incredibly fast, especially at that time. So the other reason for the spread of the Reformation was this commitment to use the new technology, which was the printing press of movable type, and to, to get the message into the, the language of the common people. The other factor that I'd like to mention that really ensured the, the rapid cultural change was an emphasis on personal accountability and sphere accountability. Sometimes I get the impression that we, we think we can teach our way to revival and reformation. Not, not the reformation, certainly. There has to be accountability structures. And one thing that we have not worked out in general is the whole question of authority in the church. What is our authority in discipling, for example? Uh, we, we can say that Calvin probably got that one wrong. And one of the problems of the reformation here is that the church probably had too much authority in certain areas. Um, the pastor of each parish, we mentioned the deacon who was there to take care of the poor and needy, make sure they got help, but the pastor in each parish had one major responsibility outside of preaching in his church, and that was 
conflict resolution. They went after people who were in conflict and they called them to reconciliation. There were also neighborhood councils in each parish where if a guy was beating his wife or the wife was going out to the tavern in the evening or vice versa, they would get called before the neighborhood council and, and told to change their behavior. Now this is where things went overboard and these councils took too much authority in certain situations. And we can say, yeah, well, that was really wrong. But we need to remember the context. This was a, a city in crisis. The Duke of Savoy was periodically threatening invasion. In the first years, the pastors were alongside the people, and they were rebuilding the city walls stone by stone. And you can see one of those 16th century walls. They found it when they, when they did the underground parking garage. This was a wartime situation. Calvin knew he had a very short years to change the city, to draw them together, to bring them to that place of maturity and unity so that they could be independent and free. So there were drastic measures, as there are in any wartime. And we need to remember that as well, and also that he was the first one to try these things. And um, we can be critical of Calvin today because we always get it right. We can say that even though he got certain areas wrong, that he, he made the effort. He laid down his life for it. He paid the price for the Reformation. And went further in one generation than anyone else has before or since.